You'll notice that we also have a, a throwback here to the Newport Artillery Company, my favorite group of guys, <laughs> because they look so sharp. And this is Colonel Bob Edback. So please welcome those folks. Uh, you'll hear more about the compact and also from a descendant of one of the signers of the compact in a few minutes. But first, I'd like to ask you to stand and uh, say along with me the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to introduce the uh, Vice President of the Town Council, Linda Chikuzo, is going to make a few remarks. Good morning. Um, my name is Linda Uji I am Vice President of the Portsmouth Town Council, and I'd like to welcome everyone here um, and to thank the Portsmouth Historical Society and all the individuals who have helped organize today's event, which gives us a rare opportunity to view this incredible piece of local history, the Portsmouth Compact of 1638. Um, today we will hear from Jim Garman, uh, President of the Historical Society, who will provide some background. Uh, as well as Ashley Salima, who brought that compact and will be available for answers afterwards. And David Chase, a current uh, local resident who can trace his ancestors back to our founders. Um, I asked Doug what he wanted me to say today beyond this little introduction, and basically he said, why history is important. And uh, you'll be happy to know, he also said several times, just a few words. <laughs> so um, I, I'll quote George Santayana who said those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And okay, we are not really in danger of having a group of people who live in Portsmouth break away and move to Newport. But we are living in a time when we all see examples, sometimes shocking examples, of people who are ignorant of historical facts. And this is a real danger because as Thomas Jefferson said, an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. So to everyone here today, thank you for educating yourselves and others about history and, and thereby protecting our democracy. Thank you. thank you, Linda. It was also very brief. <laughs> okay, now let me introduce the Portsmouth Town Historian and the President of the Portsmouth Historical Society, Jim Garman. Jim's going to talk a little bit about the compact and its significance to our town. Please welcome Jim Carr. Asking me to be brief? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Especially when it's about history. This is a special occasion. We call this Founders Day on March 7th because, at least according to the compact, that's when the compact was signed. Um, however, the, I have to advise you that there was, in those days, there was an old style calendar, a new style calendar, and a Portsmouth style calendar. <laughs> we don't really know absolutely what the date was, except the compact is signed on uh, the 7th of March, which was the, March was the, the beginning of March was the first day of spring, uh, and so they, that's how they talked about it. But it's really a special opportunity to have the compact here. This is a uh, this is about the sixth year that we've had it uh, for display. It, it rests in the archives of the state. And um, the first year that we had it, which was 2013, it was in a book. And the book was the record of the first uh, town meetings of Portsmouth. Uh, but one of the things that happened, just uh, briefly historically, was that after they had been here for two months, there was a certain amount of divisiveness uh, between the settlement here. And uh, some of the people felt that there were better opportunities elsewhere. And so under the leadership of William Coddington and John Clark and a few other people, uh, nine of them left and went to settle Newport the next year, 1639. Uh, so the 
when they went, they, they adjourned a town meeting and they, they took the book of records, including the compact, to Newport. And in Newport, the book itself, and we had the book one year, uh, had the records of the Newport town meeting as well as the Portsmouth compact. So it kind of got scattered that way. We're glad it's been saved, however, and, and exists. I often tell people that, that in, in May of uh, 1639, Portsmouth was too crowded. There were 35 people here, so nine of them decided to leave. But it was more, more a, a opposition or, or differences of opinion between the followers of William Coddington, who was the leader of the settlement, and the followers of Anne Hutchinson. And uh, they, they didn't get along. And so uh, that's why they left. Anyway. That's, that's another book to write. <laughs> Why was the compact needed? Uh, the compact, by the way, was signed in Boston. I won't go into all the details of Anne Hutchinson's uh, situation in Boston, but she was a rebel. She was a woman who spoke out. And she was a woman who uh, called people to her home on Sunday night, and they talked about what the minister's sermon was about that morning. And she attracted quite a following in, in Boston. And eventually, again, without going into the details, she was brought to trial. She was brought to trial, uh, a political trial, and she was brought to trial as a, in a religious trial also. And the ultimate result of that, because she was so outspoken, was that she was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1637 to leave by 1638. And so, Anne Hutchinson, had a group of followers. And not only was she banished, but interestingly, one other person who signed the compact was banished, and that's William Aspinwall. They are the only two that were banished, forced out of Massachusetts Bay. The others came willingly. And so in the spring, <clears throat> excuse me, they signed the compact before they came, before they knew where they were going. <clears throat> and they expected they were going to be they looked at Long Island, they looked at New Jersey, they looked at several other places. And finally they got into contact with Roger Williams, and Roger Williams facilitated the purchase of the uh, of Aquidneck Island from the Narragansett Indians. So it was written, the compact, this piece of paper that we're looking at up here, 381 years ago, they sat down and wrote up this compact uh, in, in order to sort of, they're going out into the wilderness and they weren't sure what they were going to find out there. Uh, and they wanted to get away from Massachusetts Bay because of the rigidity of the, the uh, government of Massachusetts Bay, which was a religious government as well as a political government, same people. And so they wanted to get away. They didn't really get very far away because in modern day Tiverton, Little Compton, that was part of Massachusetts Bay. So they didn't really get terribly far away. But Roger Williams helped them to negotiate the treaty with the Antinomy and Canonicus, the treaty in which they um, purchased this island. And they purchased the island for what was recorded as 40 fathoms of white beads. We're not sure of the value of that. It's probably about the same as the purchase of Manhattan Island for $24. But the purchase, and in addition, there were other fees or other grants that were given. The Narragansetts were given 10 hoes, garden hoes, and 20, um, uh, uh, remember, uh, 10 hoes and 20, I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind here. Uh, anyway, if the Indians would leave the island by the time of winter. Uh, again, this was in the spring, this was in, in March when they negotiated, and um, they agreed to leave. So the settlers came, in April, Anne Hutchinson walked from Boston to Providence and then was brought here by, by boat. And they came in onto the island and uh, began the settlement that was here. Now, other things about the compact that are important is some of the signers. And obviously it's important that one of the signers was not Anne Hutchinson. Uh, in the days of, of that period, Agreements like this were only signed by males, and um, we hope times have changed since then. Anyway, Anne Hutchinson's husband 
signed it. That's William Hutchison, Will Hutchison. His is a third name on the compact. The first name on the compact uh, is, okay, William Coddington was the leader. He was, William Coddington was the wealthiest man in Boston. And the governor of Massachusetts was really upset about the fact that Coddington was leaving because he was such an establishment person there. So he was the first name on it and became the first important person. He was named the, uh, uh, the, the head of the settlement when they got here. Second signature was John Clark, the Reverend Dr. John Clark, who was a minister as well as a physician. And John Clark is generally credited with being the person whose signature is, whose writing is on that document. Uh, there are several references in the top right corner to religious uh, passages of scripture and um, Clark that is considered was the person who, who signed, who wrote it. And he signed second. Third was William Hutchinson. And then there were some other people that signed that were of significance. Many of them related to Anne Hutchinson. Her son, Edward Hutchinson Jr., signed it. And uh, Will Hutchinson's brother, Edward Hutchinson Sr., signed it. John Sanford, who we're going to hear a little bit more about later, who was Anne Hutchinson's son in law, he signed it. Thomas Savage, another son in law of Anne Hutchinson, signed it. But he from all records, he never came to Portsmouth. Uh, in fact, what's really bizarre when you think about it with Anne Hutchinson's differences with the governor of Massachusetts Bay, that um, Thomas Savage ultimately later on in his life became the governor of Massachusetts. So, an interesting twist. William Aspinwall signed it, and again, he was the only other one that was banished, only one of that group. Other people were banished, but the only one that came here uh, was... Uh, uh, also a signer, and he and Ann Hutchinson. Interestingly, on the compact, and you'll look if you look closely at it, you'll see this. There are four names down at the bottom, and and those four names are Thomas Clark, John Johnson, William Hall, and John Brightman Esquire. And there's a line drawn through those those names. Uh, the idea generally accepted is that um, they signed the compact in Boston, and then for whatever reason they didn't come. They didn't come with the first settlers. Uh, there's been some research done that says three of them eventually did get here. But they, that's, they're crossed off, which is kind of an interesting uh, item on the, uh, on the compact itself. So after they signed the compact and after they negotiated with Roger Williams, the idea that, that he could help them purchase this island, uh, they came to this area and made a settlement. The general nature of the settlement is probably um, mid-April and into May. The first town meeting was held in May. And the first town meeting is really important. Uh, there were some signs around the town a few years ago that said that Portsmouth was the birthplace of American democracy. That's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, I don't like the idea of being the first of anything. Uh, but nonetheless, the idea that the town meeting was, a, was the government and everybody who was a free man could participate in the town meeting. And we had town meetings in Portsmouth until uh, 1980 sometime, which got pretty much out of control by the 1980s. Uh, but we did have them. And the idea of town meeting was that everybody was equal, everybody had a vote. But keep in mind that in the 1630s, the only people who were accepted to be members of the town were people who, first of all, had a certain amount of wealth, and second, uh, people who were freemen, who had been accepted by the rest of the group. There were no women in the town meetings. There were no slaves in the town meetings. We had slaves here very early on in, in our history. And, uh, and so it was a restricted group. So the concept of birthplace of American democracy is a little bit of a stretch as far as I'm concerned. So, they negotiated the treaty with Miantonomi and Canonicus, two familiar names to most of you who live around here. Um, and the negotiations took place down in Narragansett country. And they went, Roger Williams went with them. They went down there uh, by canoe, I guess, and, and negotiated this treaty. And on the way back, uh, they decided that they would honor William Dyer by naming an island after him. Dyer's Island is down off Melville. And that was a uh, name for William Dyer, who was the, the secretary of the first settlement here. So the 
settlement of the colony then continued for that first year, and it grew quite dramatically. Again, there was, there was no other settlement on the island for, for the first year. Obviously, most of the people were farmers, and, and they, had, they set aside the northern tip of the island to a commonly fenced point where they put a, a, a fence across, and everybody could grow, graze their sheep, cows, horses, whatever, in that area. We have a, a published volume, it was published in 1901, of the town records, the second book of the town records. And about half of it is what are called earmarks, which were little marks that they made to identify whose sheep this was and so on. And, and it's, it's really pretty difficult reading to make much sense out of, but the, uh, the town records do have all those earmarks on them. So the, I just found my notes and the, the let, allowing the Indians to leave the island by the winter cost, uh, cost the colonists 10 coats and 20 coats. Okay. And, and the, the phrase indeed was, if they shall remove themselves from off the island before next winter. Okay. They came back some. And in fact, when the settlers went to Newport and settled, settled in Newport, the encouragement, by the way, in point to Newport was there was dissent here in Portsmouth, but Newport was, had the prospect of being a much better harbor. And these were businessmen who really wanted to get involved in trade. And you couldn't trade much. Most of you know, in, at least your Portsmouth people know, where the town pond is, up by the Roger Williams Conference Center. Okay? And that was the main access onto the island uh, for the early settlers. Well, that wasn't much of a harbor respectively. So they decided Newport was better, so they moved down to Newport, nine of them, led by Coddington and Clark and, and a number of others, very famous names in Newport. If you read off these names, you'd know exactly who they were, because the names are still around. That's one thing about this island. There's a lot of genealogical connections. So the settlement in Newport, they brought the Indians back, the Native Americans, I should say, brought them back to help build the harbor. And they brought in a lot of fill, because it was a swamp. And they brought in a lot of fill, and the Indians helped them establish Newport as a harbor. Newport grew dramatically over the course of that time. And by the time of the Revolutionary War, Newport was one of the five major ports of, the, of British North America. Boston, Newport, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston, <coughs> South Carolina. Those are the five major ports. However, and again, this is another lecture, the British occupied this island for three years during the Revolutionary War, and we had a major battle here, for those that aren't aware, in, in, uh, during the Revolutionary War, uh, and that devastated the economy of Newport. And Newport never really recovered. They tried in the 1790s, early 1800s, but then we got into another war with the British, the War of 1812. And so uh, Newport never recovered. And from one particular person's perspective, I'm glad they didn't. Because Newport could have been Manhattan. Think about it. Oh my god. Okay. So anyway, so what we're doing here today is celebrating the existence, the continuation of this wonderful document that we have before us. It is really special. And it's very important. I mean, when you you look at a document, you see Ann Hutchinson's husband's signature there. That is really special. And in this town, we have a wonderful history that goes back to 1638. I spent a lot of my life reading and writing and talking about it. And it's just really a, a great opportunity to see this document and to see where it all began. We are very fortunate to have this. We are very fortunate that State Archives is willing to bring it down to us. Thank you. And uh, it's really a wonderful thing for display. So with that, I will close my remarks. I'm happy to talk to anybody about any of this after we're all done here. Uh, we'll be here till, till 1 o'clock uh, with the, uh, the compact on display. So really feel free to come up to us and ask questions. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, David Chase, who's a descendant of one of the signers of the compact and a founder of our town, John Sanford. 
David contacted me, uh, I don't know, about a month ago. I guess he had been in contact with Lois uh, from the Historical Society before that, uh, talking about his, his descendant tree that goes all the way back to John Sanford. And uh, I, I'd like to ask him to come up and talk briefly about it. It's a, it's a fascinating look. And every year that we hold this thing, someone comes up who can trace his ancestors all, week, all the way back to the 1638 compact. To me, that's kind of incredible. But anyway, David, I wonder if you come up and say a few words about your ancestors. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> just, just a few words. <laughs> Although I probably could talk for on, on and on, but thank you, Doug and Jim. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, my mother, who is a Sanford, had been um, looking at the genealogy of the family and trading correspondence with her family members back in the 1960s. And I do have a picture at home of her up at Founders Brook in 68. So, but I never heard much about it from my family growing up. Um, so my full name is David Sanford Chase. So there's a link, both Sanfords and Chases. My grandmother was down at 217 East Main Road. Several generations were married and buried at St. Mary's. Uh, I spent summers here with my grandmother Chase and over in Westport, Massachusetts with my grandmother Sanford. Um, so a little bit, you heard most about the compact and all, but John did come over in 1631 into to, to Boston. He was part of, uh, well, he came on the ship Lion. And the Lion actually made about four trips in this, from 1630 to 1632, uh, bringing colonists over. It wasn't, she wasn't really related, as far as I can read, to John Winthrop's Amadas, but everybody kind of acknowledges that John Winthrop knew about it because it was parallel and going to the same place. Um, also, what's kind of interesting is that back in, I guess it was Alfred in England, um, John and Anne Hutchinson were in, you know, both in the same town in England. And so it's, I think it's kind of this trickle down of everybody bailing out for religious reasons and uh, coming to the United States or the states, the colonies. Um, something I found a little interesting just reading coming was there was a phrase, the Great Migration of the 1630s with uh, all these uh, colonists being recruited and coming to support the colonies. So anyway, John was, had been married or married in Boston to uh, Elizabeth Webb. They had two sons, John Jr. and Samuel. My line is through Samuel. Um, she passed away in 1635 in Boston. And then uh, John, I guess the sharp guy he was, Apparently, he uh, married um, Bridget Hutchinson, his daughter, and came to uh, Portsmouth. Uh, they had several children. I think it was nine. I forget exactly. Uh, second son was uh, Pelleg. Uh, he's probably one of the more well-known. Uh, he moved. He went down to Newport and was a, uh, a merchant. Um, uh, but then he also, he became a, a governor, served three terms as the governor. And I did, was reading a book about the, um, I'll get it wrong, it wasn't the Indian Wars, uh, King Philip's Wars. Mm -hmm. And there is a mention of uh, them, uh, the colonists going to Pelleg's house in Newport. And then uh, going on up, there was a battle up around Mount Hope. Uh, <coughs> So just back to John for a minute, he, um, my notes, and I left copies here, uh, did say he was driven from Boston. Um, the, uh, I guess the detail of that perhaps was that he was a uh, cannoneer and had uh, involvement in Boston with the armament of the city. And uh, what, one of the things I read was that the council up there looked at him and said, well, because of your associations and some of your beliefs, we don't think you can have that responsibility. Uh, so, 
uh, he had many things, and in fact, he, uh, the year of his death, 1653, uh, he was uh, president or governor, you see it both ways, of Portsmouth and, uh, and Newport. So, you know, we're very proud of that uh, lineage and having that history. Um, the one thing I found very interesting uh, in reading about his will, that he had a ferry, and he left that ferry, and the great ferry boat it was referred to, to his son, John Jr. I have no idea what that ferry operated. <laughs> I don't have the details. So anyway, Samuel, he's our line. Um, he was uh, born in Boston. He, just going through it real quick. He died here in Portsmouth, married to Sarah Waddell. Had a son William, again born in Portsmouth, but died in uh, Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Might have been what's now Westport. Dartmouth and Westport were the same at the time. Uh, then his son, there's several Williams here, um, also uh, was in Dartmouth. And my line of the fam, that's the last of my line of Sanfords uh, here in Portsmouth. They all bailed out. And, went over to uh, Westport and Dartmouth area. Um, goes up through, um, I guess the one that I really enjoy hearing about is uh, David Milk Sanford. Uh, perhaps what Sanford Road over in Westport is named after, but he had a dairy farm there. And there are several other Sanfords along the road. And there's a small cemetery at uh, near 422 that has many Sanfords uh, buried there. Um, the end next two on my list, Everett and Harold, they were in Fall River uh, Carpenters. Um, Everett went on to uh, becoming a wheelwright, had a wheelwright shop, uh, particularly making wheels for ice wagons. Uh, also, we have some uh, correspondence and um, letters that uh, my grandfather was up in uh, Wichington, Massachusetts. Now, I think it's Quavin Reservoir, uh, cutting ice. So some interesting history. Um, my mother, Ruth Evelyn Sanford, was born in Fall River, grew up in Westport. They had a cottage also out on Horseneck Beach, uh, destroyed in the 38 hurricane. Um, my uncle, her brother, was Harold L. Sanford. Um, and I will say I enjoyed growing up uh, and being able to come up and spend summers in this uh, area with my two grandmothers. I, I was a Navy child, so did a fair amount of traveling. Just be, when I end, I'd just like to introduce my wife, Jill. We met at the University of Rhode Island, <coughs> had uh, many wonderful years together. And our daughter, Shirley, who is uh, kind of the ge uh, genealogy uh, uh, expert of the family. So thank you very much. And we left some things here for the society or anybody else that'd like to look through. Thank you. Thank you. you with this framed copy as wow. a very, very high digitally mastered copy of the, of the compact. And in case you can't read that, it's all written on here. But thank you so much for coming down and sharing your ancestors. Well, with thank us. you very much. It's a great <laughs> I will just say it was a you know, thank you again. This means so much. I saw that it was on your website and available, yeah. but now to receive it, that's great. Well, that's but, great. Uh, so thank you. This concludes the, really the formal part of our program, if there is a formal part. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come forward and take a look, closer look at the compact itself. Please don't touch it. You can't quite touch it anyway because of the, the container. Uh, or take flash photos of it. You can take pictures of your regular uh, phone camera or whatever. But uh, we don't want to do any damage to this historic document. Uh, as we mentioned before, archivist Ashley Salima will be on hand to kind of answer questions about how it's stored, any other th uh, things you'd like to know about it. Uh, and I'd like to just end with kind of a commercial. Okay? Uh, today's showing is one of the many events that the Portsmouth Historical Society holds during the course of the year. Uh, 
you know, we, we started out a few, a few years ago and our membership had dwindled down to, say, 60 to 80 people. Uh, we, we're now up in the 600 and, and going range. Uh, we're trying to bring people back, but more important, we want to people to come in and support us and support the real significance of knowing about our history. Uh, it's almost criminal to me that we don't do more history, local history, in the schools. Now, one of the things we're trying to do is change that, of course. Uh, next week uh, on uh, Thursday, we're having a youth trivia contest, which all the questions are about portrait history. It involves the high school and the middle school teams. It's kind of a lot of fun. That's one way to get kids involved and something that's fun to do, and they might actually learn something. Uh, I would like to say that you saw the uh, framed copy of the compact. Uh, when you do leave, well, you'll notice our table uh, out there. You can't, can't quite get by it without seeing it. Uh, we have uh, copies of the compact, uh, both framed and unframed, on sale. Uh, we also have uh, membership forms or others, other forms that you can Join us. Join us as a member of the prices are very inexpensive, starting at $15 a year for individuals. But in order to keep these kind of things going, we need your help. It all, can, all has to come from the people. So with that, let me just thank you all for coming. And uh, please come up and take a look at this historic document. Thank you.